And it's recording, very good. So welcome everyone. Today is August the 26th of 2021. Um, this is the Prometheus Staff Summit and we are about to get started. So um, uh, we got we just got one question, um, how to get stuff onto the agenda if you're not part of Prometheus team. Um, that is relatively easy. Either just voice it here or send it to Prometheus team. We'll put it on our backlog, backlog vote on the backlog, and then um, we, we discuss it in one of the future Dev Summits. Um, we are starting to clean out our backlog uh, quite nicely, so we will run out of topics in, I don't know, a month or five. Not in one month. Um, yeah. For anyone, I think everyone wrote themselves into the into the agenda as attendees. If not, I'm going to share the thing once again. There you go. And the first topic goes to Bjorn, getting rid of P uh, the PKG directory. I think we talked about this a little bit at one uh, at one time, but we didn't finish, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, and I even didn't understand what it's for. Um, so context is essentially given in the link. So the at least the urban legend is I don't know how true it is that um, this PKG directory just came from the Google Build system, which which could actually be true from what I know from the old Google Build system, and somehow it leaked to the outside through early Go development, and then people thought you should have public packages or something, or packages for reusal in PKG, um, and have the, I don't know, there were some other directories for the binaries, whatever. The CMD thing is also like, it happened, whatever. Like, uh, um, personally, I think this is not helpful. Like, if you have packages that you want to be used, then they're normal packages. And if not, put them into internal. And there's a blog post, I think, by Dave Cheney, which is linked which explains that. But of course, it's just me, so there might be other reasons. Uh, I just, whenever I add code, I feel lost if the code shows, should go into the PKG directory or into a other directory. <laughs> so at, at the very least, I would like to understand when is a package in the PKG directory. And uh, from what I know right now, I would just simplify and, and get rid of the PKG. So please discuss. <laughs> I think Peter Borgon had the input to that whole discussion that PKG is still nice. And I kind of share that in repositories that are not pure Go, but have different components, like we have the React app in there and other stuff, um, to still kind of group Go code under there. Um, but then, of course, there's a question like, what do we do with the other high top level directories that also contain Go code? Should they maybe all go into PKG? Yeah, which is, I would totally understand if we say PKG is where all the Go code goes except the CMD Go code, right? But now we have like 80% of the code outside of PKG and we have a few things which kind of maybe there are like generic packages, but it's not like consistent and we don't want any of them to be like we, we as far as I know, we don't intend to advertise those packages as like the reusable parts that would be in a different repo than as of now, right? Um, so six years ago, there was a refactoring made in Prometheus to remove PKG, and then it came back. So Fabian did both like the removing of it and the re-adding of it, I think. And I think he never asked anyone about so it. He, he, PKG, what was in PKG at the time was moved to util. So now we have PKG and util. Yeah, so this is one thing. I mean, in any case, you should find some consistency and have a rule and um, so that at least we know what to, what to um, converge towards. Um, so that's the, the one important thing, right? Um, the other thing is... Yeah. Um, I, I think like my, my mental model about these directories, like the, the top level directories that are not PKG has always been like, these are the actual 
or most of them actually the the runtime components that the prometheus server starts up when it starts like the the scraping stuff the rule manager this and that like um mostly those directories i guess should map to like you know long running go routines part components of the prometheus server that are actually running but that's probably not a hundred percent uh correct mapping, but mostly that's that's true. And then they use kind of more finer grained internal libraries that kind of live under PKG. Um, but that, that's, I think, how it was currently intended. I'm not sure if it you know, makes sense to stay like that, of course. Yeah, so Bartik just writes, move reusable packages to PKG, but what are reusable packages? Every package that is not main package that you don't build because main package you can't import. So it's not reusable. Everything else is PKG, whatever else. But don't put okay, that in so root. That would be all Go code, except the yeah. CMD one goes yeah. into PKG. Correct. Yeah, I mean, that like would be so much better than what that. we do now. But I would still just not have PKG. It's just overhead from my point. But that's so much better than having this mix mishmash. I like having. I would be, I would be happy with non PKG as well. Yeah. Well, I, I think in a in a in a repository that does not only have Go code, I, I still like to have like all the Go code in one hierarchy, and PKG seems to still be like the standard, even if it's disputed for that. But then you have PKG and CMD, right? I mean, which is yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's still so okay. Like but... Libraries and CMD and PKG uh, is all the libraries, all the non-main code. Basically, I just don't buy the argument. I want to have the Go code in one hierarchy, right? Because you have now you have it in two hierarchies, and the name of the hierarchy doesn't even tell you it's Go code, right? I mean, that would be more like we should have a Go directory. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, following that argument. Good. Yeah, it's so. good enough. And I, I am also not sure it's worth to break all the people with dependent TSDB and discovery and even role managers just to move everything into PKG. I, I agree that, I think like, it's I, not a problem. It's come on, like everyone just builds and just set everything. That's not a problem, Julian, at this point. Yeah. It's okay, so a I mean, a problem, no, but it's causing a lot of work for many people for little added value. I, I, I think we are a Go repository. It's fine to just have Go code in our repository. And we should just maybe just think about why we have both PKG and util, because that's, that's the main point to me that we have like two generic. Uh, library like uh, directories in the Go code. And we have a lot of generic reusable code outside of util and PKG, right? Yes, but what and, is... And none of those packages is supposed to be a library anyway. <laughs> but what's in PKG and util is very small, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like the script manager or the discovery, which has like thousands of yeah. packages and like uh, multiple thousands of lines of code. So what's in PKG is pretty small. Yeah, that's what, why I think we should just lift everything in PKG up or put it into the util directory or whatever, like some telling name, not PKG, which is not telling me anything, right? It's a package. I would say, like, Bjorn, like it's everyone, every Go developer knows about that. Like that's a that's the point. Like it, it is not named Golang, but for Go developer, it is literally a Go. It's even better. It's more consistent. So. I don't know why it's not visible if it, that's not Go. Like every project does that. No, I mean there are very famous Go programmers who say you should not use PKG. But they know that they will look Go code in PKG, right? Yeah, I mean, but that's then we should move everything there, right? Except CMD. I agree. I mean, okay, let's first find out. Do we do we all agree that we should do something consistent, or do I mean there could be you, we could make the point we shouldn't change anything because it's just overhead and just go with the current state. Um, but like, do we all agree we would want to make it consistent, either way? Should we vote or like raise hands or something? I mean, you could just say you 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 don't want consistency at all costs. Well, uh, I think I want to. Either have PKG or util, but I don't want to move TSDB discovery and that kind of packages. Yeah. Yeah. So we have one vo voice against. I mean, uh, conditional, right? Right. If the if the consistent solution doesn't involve moving everything into PKG, it might be fine. 
So Julian, you would prefer to have the current state over moving everything into PKG? Yeah, I, I would prefer to move util into PKG by, for example, but mm. not like TSDP script and that kind of thing, which are used by hundreds of packages. Yeah, and I see this point. This would also, of course, even if you move util, it might cause breakage, but I think it would be lower. And you see that Prometheus code is used by 700 people now, thanks to GitHub. So. Okay. So we want to change something, most likely, right? Yeah. Now we just mm -hmm. have to agree what to change. Anyway, okay. some option. Some option, just to summarize, some option would be to just move util, leave TSDB, discover bigger packages, and mention, yeah, we move that only in free dot Prometheus, rest, new packages, everything else. When you touch something, if you maybe touch something, you move to PKG. That might be one rule that would help a bit. Sorry, Richie, I interrupt you, I think. No, no worries. Um... My, my gut is that um, eventual consi consistency for 2.0 and potentially moving everything for 3.x is uh, is probably the, the least bad approach, where thing is just moved slowly as, as it's opportunistic, but not like one huge thing within 2.x. I mean, I think we are very explicit about our versioning being not about our our libraries and packages, right? I don't think we should even um, how to phrase that. Yeah, we should not commit to follow the Go mode versioning. We should not even uh, um, create the impression that we would pay attention to that. But I would also know that moving everything will then be a pain to do like git bisect and that kind of things and seeing the git history for some file. Uh, all of that becomes complicated in a directory like TSDB. I do that a lot looking at the history of the files and if you move them, it's a lot more complex. Yeah, that's why I suggest we just move everything, the, those few things in PKG out of it into util or whatever name makes sense as a name and then be done with it and never have PKG ever again. Yeah. Unless it's a package manager or something that is called PKG, then it could be in PKG. <laughs> I mean, who feels strongly about either, the, who feels strongly about any aspect of this other than eventual consistency? I well, don't it, understand. It, it depends what you mean by eventual consistency. So my, I, I thought um, that that doing that moving stuff when it's when it's opportunistic is is something where we uh, where we can find consensus. Um, from what I gather, Bjorn would prefer to to move stuff more aggressively and earlier and not even have implicit stability guarantees for anyone who renders the code or, or reuses the code. Um, there's at least Bartik and Ben seem to be more on the side of um, do it slowly when, when it happens. And then at the next major version, we can still be bold. Um, and I'm trying to find if, if if there's more people on either of those positions or if there's a third position. I mean, there, it's different. Moving everything into PKG would be a huge disruptive change, right? But moving those three packages we have in PKG out of it would be okay, mad, right? And I, I stumbled upon this because we created new a new package for these sparse histograms and then somebody of my coworkers put it uh, into the PKG directory and, and like again, I couldn't say why is this now going into the PKG and not somewhere else. Um, so I, this again, this is the first high-level thing I want to understand: when is PKG and when not? And we could, I mean, that would be the minimum outcome here. We have a rule, and whenever we do something new, we follow that rule. 
and perhaps if we are um, we want to we move something around but the secondary thing is what should that rule look like and I would vote for the most simple rule we just don't use a PKT director yes and uh, I have been looking and in all the dependencies we are using in Prometheus almost none of them is using PKG so it's not really common so we can put a deprecation notice into the PKG directory and say no one should be using this anymore. Or the other extreme, everything is moved into util, go, pkg, yada, yada. Um, I mean, does anyone feel strongly about retaining pkg? Julius, a little bit, of course, other languages. We can just do a completely new thing and call it slash go um, and break I would, everything. I would, yeah, I would do PKG. It's like a Golang based project. Like you in Kubernetes have this. So, yeah, I would argue strongly here. But you mean only yeah. Kubernetes says it? No, I, I mean, I mean that Kubernetes also have this. Sure, it's not 100% projects, but. They, I kind of people know what to expect. Docker, all those they must have it as well. No, I don't. I don't think I. I will be super strongly blocking anything. It, it can be go. It can be. I would avoid root because we have tutorials, docs, and just so much stuff that are unrelated to code even. So. Just it's always better to have some um, SRC, SRC or anything like that, or PKG might as might as well, or Go. I would be fine as well. Okay, but that's again we have tons of stuff. Like just talking about Prometheus, Prometheus, tons of stuff in the root directory. So that would be an important thing to know that we lazily or aggressively either or <laughs> move stuff to somewhere else. Um, which yeah, I don't know if we if we would get consensus on that. Well, if we do that, we can just take the opportunity to take the vanity prometheus.io GitHub uh, Golang import name. So you don't need to import the PKG directory, but you just import prometheus.io slash. TSDB discovery. Sounds complex. And then rename it, we rename it to Epimetoys at some point, and everyone hates everyone. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is if we can do all of this, like if we if we can come to the complete conclusion here where we now have a full definition of the thing, or if we should approach this incrementally and, for example, just agree that we don't put new packages in PKG, and uh, if we feel like it, we could also move something out at some opportunity because you, you do some larger refactoring anyway or something. Um, but then we would still have the open question, should we do like a major reorg where, where Go code is just in a different hierarchy uh, or, or not? Let's let, let, let's do this piecemeal. Ganesh, Gautam, can you switch on your cameras for a second, please? Um, so first, let's, let's try and find consensus that we do want to have a consistent thing. Yeah. Then we let, let's do this piecemeal um, just to just to unblock a little. Also, I need to call out Jan here uh, explicitly as the only person who is actually writing anything. I, I also wrote a little bit, but beyond this, I think no one other than Jan did anything here. So thank you, Jan. He is the person of this call. So consensus: uh, we want to get to. So consensus, we want to get to an a to a consistent state. All agreed? Anyone disagreeing? Good. Okay, Julius doesn't care, but everyone else is in favor. Perfect. Um, 
So um, then the question is, Bjorn does not want to have PKG. Julius wants to have PKG, but they're both in Berlin, so they can meet and fight. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think anyone else really cares, do they? I don't want to have everything under PKG. Sorry, you what? I don't want to have everything under PKG. Okay, so we have two in favor of removing PKG. But you I mean, mean the, the middle ground would be you have some definition, you define a subset of packages that have some properties that make them suitable to go into PKG, right? I, That's just the... I just think it's weird. Like, if we have it, we should have all of them in there. <laughs> and if we don't have it, then even better. <laughs> I mean, Julius, to, to flip it, um, it's mainly a Go project. Like, there's other stuff, but it is mainly a Go project. As such, uh, it would probably make more sense if you need to move stuff to, me, to move other stuff into its own subdirectory. Like, slash JS or something, if you need it. I mean, I, I, I get this argument. It's a mixed product. We have documentation, which is not code at all, or perhaps it's code. <laughs> uh, but then this would be a major refactoring of the whole repo, right? Just having PK, PK that would be just a, a, a subtopic. What should that directory be called? Uh, we, no, no. we don't have this right now. My, my point is a different one. My point is, if we get rid of PKG, um, to to address Julius's point, uh, we can say that the root level is Go, and if you want to write JavaScript or Perl or C hash, uh, you need to have subdirectories for those languages. Yeah, yeah, I got that. I'm just saying that if we remove PKG or not, that is just such a tiny fraction of the code that it's actually kind of almost orthogonal to that question. By removing PKG, we are not making things significantly worse in terms of where does the Go code go, right? Because 90% of the code doesn't go into a specific directory. That's... So we could still do this, but it would be almost independent. Uh, I agree, it's almost independent. My point is by tying them together, uh, this might get Julius to a consensus position or to a position where you can find consensus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I see pros and cons with either of the approaches. Um, yeah, hmm. I guess I'm slightly more for an approach where eventually things like all the Go code is under one directory, but eh, not I mean, per, super feeling I, Sorry. Um, I mean, I, I do want to say that so we have stuff that's currently root that is not Go code is CI configs, we have docs, we have documentation, so two docs <laughs> folders. We have um, actually console uh, libraries, like the default um, console template stuff. Um, so there's already a couple of directories, definitely, that are not part of the actual Go code, but that that we want to. And so the, the question is, like, how do we make things easily discoverable? Um, but I don't know if that out outweighs um, you know, what Julian mentioned about, you know, having, requiring so many people to update their code and potentially breaking big git, uh, bisects, git logs, and so on. So I'm, I'm kind of torn. I don't really feel strongly either way. So maybe as a middle ground, we retain PKG, but we put a deprecation notice in there. So nothing new gets moved there or nothing new gets put there. And with 3.x, we will probably just get rid of it, or maybe not. But then we we have a clear rule, and we don't have any immediate breakage or potential potential breakage. Is the software approach something which you would be fine with, Bjorn, or do you want something stronger? I would be fine with any solution where we where I know where to put my code. <laughs> so. First, right? That's that's um, that would already make me happy. The um, it's kind of the icing on the cake would be to get rid of this directory that has no meaning for me. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just like if if we this is what we discuss, like why this is so complicated because we have to agree what we we are talking about the 
kind of grander layout of this thing in perhaps a distant future. And some people say they wouldn't move a lot of code around. And um, yeah, that's where I'm not even sure if we should, should connect those two things. And I also note that this is, this is not only Prometheus, Prometheus, but if we move everything into PKG, we would do it in Alert Manager and all the other basically uh, Golang repositories, which is a lot of work or an, another type of incon inconsistency, which is inconsistency between our own packages. Yeah, where do we draw the line? Like most of the Go repos have a documentation directory. Some even have docs and documentation, and one has the mix in, and the other has the actual doc. <laughs> I mean, we have all those things that we could smooth, like smoothen out eventually. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's something we should decide right now. So, how about we? And I, I, I had on my back burner that we need to go through the through the repository as well or through the org. Um, we deprecate PKG in Prometheus Prometheus uh, and write something like we might completely remove it with 3.x. And then we don't tie ourselves to anything in the future, but we have a clear path to follow for the foreseeable future. I just wouldn't put 3.x there because yeah. that is, okay. this suggests that we have some code level semantic versioning, which we don't. So I would just say this this could be moved perhaps like I mean, the deprecation notice, please don't add more packages here. Existing packages may be moved out here eventually. That that would be kind of the soft word. The, the final question is, do we want to do this across the complete org or just for Prometheus Prometheus? Do we have any PKG directory in any repo except Prometheus Prometheus? Does it matter for this? Our manager has PKG. It does labels and what time is. Not a lot of changes. Last change. Oh, last change by Bjorn. Yeah, so let's let's deprecate it across the complete org. So I didn't understand that. Do we have any other PKG? Yes, in alert manager. In alert manager. Yes. Okay. Maybe also in others. Alert manager is the only one I checked. So yeah, let's sure. just say it across the org. OK, consensus. We will put the deprecation notice into PKG in the Prometheus org or across the Prometheus org. All agreed? Anyone disagreeing? Yeah, so we, we have a few. Um, from bench, stats exporter, test infer, memcached exporter, alert manager, and from you. So possibly even projects that really don't only have Go code, they still have this PKG for, I think, the reason that Dave Cheney reported in that blog post. Yeah, but now we have the, it doesn't matter. Now we have the deprecation for yeah. everything, and we can just put it there and, and be done with it. Next one is probably a quick one, but we are still, as far as I remember, waiting. Um, the next one is have a Google form as a as vulnerability handling platform. Um, the note from last time is that Six Security has an interesting initiative, and I don't think beyond them being renamed as te uh, sorry Tag secu Security uh, formally. Yeah, no, still no update. Um, so I suggest we we just. Track it. Um, it. It had the votes to be discussed, but we will still wait for tech security to um, to publish something, and then we intend to follow this. Anyone against this and wants to move more quickly? Very good. Uh, I, I know that Ganesh wanted to prioritize the alert generator conformance for timing issues. Fair. Um, we 
it's one of the three vote things anyway now. Um, that's the post, that's the... Okay, Ganesh, you have the floor and I'm copying stuff over. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I guess we are going to launch the conformance program in KubeCon, which is happening in October. And we already have three compliance tests, which is open metrics, PromQL, and remote write. So I guess we also need to have a compliance test for alert generation. So that's the whole point of this item. So here I don't want to discuss on specifics of what to have as a spec for compliance, but I want to discuss about the alert generator conformance as a whole. As are any objections with this idea, or if anyone had a look at the doc, any concerns? I had a lot of a look. <laughs> Cut English. Um, I like it a lot. Um, the one thing is, I think, as part of writing the tests, it makes sense to to write the behavior of of the alert generation as specification language, even if it's not a full specification. And I will be more than happy to, to help you with RFC uh, 2119 language, like must, should, may, must not, should not, may not. Uh, may not is not, it doesn't matter. Um, of course, I think uh, writing, writing the tests or the test results as a spec will force people to actually agree on the specifics of the thing. Beyond this, I like it a lot and think we should just have consensus to accept it. And, and the, the idea, the plan for the launch is to have a fully fledged spec as the first goal. And because there are a few things which are not very easy to test, it's not a goal to cover everything that's said in the spec to have it in the test suit uh, in the launch, but we will eventually cover everything that's there in the spec in time to come. But we want to have a fully fetched spec as much as we can have. Um, I have a question. So I have added two points at the bottom, a suggestion, and you accepted them. The first mm -hmm. one is that you should send the alerts every minute if you are an alert generator, which is what Prometheus and Alert Manager is expecting. But I am mm -hmm. not sure about the second one because the second one is more like uh, that you should be able to send the alert to multiple URLs because when you have a HA cluster of Alert Manager, then you need to be able to duplicate those uh, those alerts to all of them. So this is the Prometheus model, but I don't know if we want that to be part of the conference program, because this is like implying uh, our deployment strategy for Alert Manager and our HA strategy for Alert Manager to everyone. I don't know if that's something that you actually want or not in the conference program. Um, I just oh. accepted with the short set. I think the last point, the 11th point, which is multiple URLs, that might not be exactly required because we want to test if it's generating the alerts properly and if it is sending to an endpoint. So you, I don't think. I, I would still then maybe uh, move that from a must to should or could mm -hmm. or. Okay. My, my gut would be that it, it should be possible or it, like it. I think I would retain a must, but precisely this type of discussion is why I think it's good to write this in normative language. Of course, then there are no 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 hidden disagreements or misunderstandings. Um, of course, precisely this kind of thing that one person thinks must, one person thinks should, um, is is automatically exposed. Um, to Ganesh's earlier point, I think it makes sense to to try and write the spec as completely as possible, even if it's not initially tested for. And like we don't even have to to say that the spec is final before we are happy with it. I wouldn't bless the spec as 1.0 before we are happy that we actually have full coverage in that spec 
for all the behavior which we expect of something which is Prometheus compatible or alert, Prometheus alert generation compliant and thus by extension compatible. So maybe we can have a consensus that we want to have a fully fledged spec for the first iteration of conformance program or the one lot of conformance program. Yep. Unless someone else wants to say anything. No, as we already discussed, it is easier to uh, to give to give someone the conformance, the final conformance rate versus adding new requirements and then removing them the stamp. I also note that this is a big change with regard to the remote write protocol because uh, this conformance test is expecting to be able to query Prometheus data, which we do not even do in our uh, remote write setup. So when we remote write, we do not check that the samples have been stored, but for this, I guess, smaller or more niche conformance thing, we would ask for a PromQL or a query endpoint. So yes, like no good. So I it puts the bar higher than the remote, right? Which does not really make sense to me. It makes but to be Prometheus conformant, I guess they also need to be PromQL compliant, I guess. And I guess we expect the query APIs to be present to test the PromQL. So we kind of have a way to query the samples. It also goes even further, like at least conceptually speaking. So A, FYI, for anyone in this call who's not aware, um, AWS and Azure um, told me they're interested in creating a test suite for the pre, uh, for Prometheus Remote Read. Um, I didn't yet see much there, but like I created a, a design document for them to, to flesh out, but I don't think there was any substantial work yet in there. Um, but that would be a thing. And the second is um, we desperately need to, to raise the bar for uh, Prometheus compatibility because I think currently what we are testing is not enough to actually capture that you are in fact fully Prometheus compatible. So um, if, if any test is raising the bar for other aspects of Prometheus, that is actually good. It's 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 actually a feature in my in my opinion, not a bug. Um, also, if we have more tests um, going towards the center, as it were, like from different directions, this actually increases the overall coverage and, and likelihood that whoever is implementing against against all those tests has a a fair chance of having something which is actually fully compatible. And not by accident. Uh, yeah. So ha having more, like I mean, flip this in your head. Let's say you want to implement something which is Prometheus compatible, and you need to defend this to your manager. Um, having something which which shows you where you still need to implement stuff and to fix stuff until you have that magic 100 percent gives you the perfect reason to get more time out of your manager to be able and allowed to invest work time into that thing. Um, so it's 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 pretty much perfect, I, I think, for anyone who uh, wants to have a good faith attempt of implementing. I also have another remark on the document that when I see the list and you see that Grafana uh, would use Prometheus to like generate uh, the alert or create the samples and then generate the alert, but it would not show that when Grafana is generating alert out of I don't know a MySQL data source that it would be valid Prometheus valid because then the downstream might not do the correct like uh, pre work on the labels. There might be invalid labels. I don't know. Thank you. 
and a story type you meant Grafana could use some other data source instead of Prometheus. And and then not all the data source may may generate Prometheus valid labels, for example. So I I don't know how that would work because like I I could see how Grafana could accidentally generate false alert while still being alert manager approved. That's a good point. Yeah. So speaking from the compliance test suite, either that means mandating which data sources can be considered Prometheus compatible. So that you say only if it's, for example, a Cortex backend, can you uh, can you actually generate Prometheus compatible um, alerts? And if you do it from MySQL, you cannot. Or it would mean that there needs to be more tests for actually compliant labels and annotations and such. I honestly don't have a strong opinion either way. Um, maybe I deliberately don't have one because I'm biased and working there. But um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. Um, but well, I, I think that Grafana as a vendor would do like the best effort to be compliant if we find a bug, because I think they would consider it a bug not to generate Prometheus style uh, alerts. So I'm not really concerned for Grafana. This is just something I just noticed. Maybe it's not important uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that that's a good, like, for the, for the test suite, speaking just for the test suite, something which you can say is, for example, that you must be able to generate alerts uh, from a Prometheus style backend. And you may emit alerts from other backends, but if you do, then they must generate compliant data. Like you cannot have a, a label name, which is UTF-8. It's only values which are UTF-8, unless I'm mistaken. Um, but maybe I'm mistaken, I don't know. Um, but like this kind of thing is precisely what, um, what this normative language brings you. So I think we should have something in there which, which tells the implementer how to deal with the situation. Um, my gut is to have as far reaching as possible of a grasp that you say that you may generate data from other data sources, but or from other backends, like let's say you have Influx or something, they also have other backends. Um, but if they do that, they must have compliant stuff. Makes sense. I mean, if you emit stuff from StatsD, no dots or what have you, like that kind of thing. So let's 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 jump back a little bit in the discussion. Um, let's try the consensus which we had earlier, just to see that we have the consensus, and then. Um, then let's also find consensus on, on that aspect. So the first part was consensus. We, inti we intend to write a full specification of Prometheus alert generation. We intend to test against this specification. We will finalize uh, a 1.0 as soon as possible, but not block implementation and release on there being a 1.0. All agreed, anyone disagreeing? Very good. Um, Chris, this should free up basically as much as we have. Um, and let's try the other consensus consensuses. Bjorn, you need to you need to figure out what the what the plural of consensus is, please, at some point. Consensi, consensi, um, consensus. Um, Alerts from other storages.
Okay, how about this? Consensus. Alerts from other storages and backends may be emitted. Additionally, may be emitted additionally to from Prometheus-like storage. If they are, they must be fully compliant with the relevant specification. All agreed? Anyone disagree? When we say Prometheus like storage, should we be specific like the storage should be remote write and PromQL compliant? I I don't think to specify this in the consensus because I think we we as we refer to the not yet finalized specification or design document which you wrote, I think whatever we find consensus in the document is just the I, I wouldn't okay. I wouldn't block myself with being too specific here. Okay, so later we can use this because when we have test suit, if it's Prometheus like storage, we want some kind of similar interfaces, I guess. No. And I mean, Prometheus like will be will be made more uh, aggressive and more constrained over the months and years, which okay. is good, I, I think. So yeah, I, so let's try again. Consensus alerts from other storages and backends may be emitted initially to from Prometheus like storage. If they are, they must be fully compatible with the relevant specification or fully compliant, let's say. Compliant to the relevant specification. All agreed? Anyone disagree? Very good. So, time check. Okay, we have more than enough time. Good. Mm -hmm. So we can either jump to after, like a post, uh, one, once we have this specified, or we can jump to PromCon a little bit, but we have time for both. So let's do the post. Um, Ganesh, you still have the floor with uh, future considerations. So, so the future consideration is about how do we configure the rules in the software is currently we do it by uh, rule files in prometheus but in cortex we do it by api because there are security issues with files and it might differ for different softwares so the proposal with this future consideration was to have one way of doing things across like one way of configuring rules across the ecosystem and the easiest way would be providing a post API for rules in Prometheus and ask other softwares to follow the same. But I guess there were some historical reasons, like it, I guess it was discussed before why we want to do only files and not API, but I don't have much context on that. So the proposal is to have a post API on Prometheus and the behavior would be like, whatever you configure via files, you cannot edit via API and whatever you add by API, you can only edit by API. So they are kind of isolated. That's the proposal. But I would like to start this topic here and know what are the historical reasons. I mean, we historically we had this a lot because it's a very obvious thing to ask for, and we very consistently rejected that. But um, we can of course revise that. But I think a lot of other things, like when we said we don't want, I mean, Grafana is the op kind of opposing example where you can have a command line flag or a config file entry or an environment variable. They all follow like the same structure. And then you can freely pick in which way you configure it. And Prometheus is kind of the opposite so far, where we said there's one and only one way of configuring something. And um, we could, of course, also like depending on the area, follow one or the other philosophy. It's just that I would like that we are all aware that we are touching this this point that yeah it's kind of connected to a lot of strings that have been put and lines drawn and stuff like that. Personally, I'm I'm don't have a strong opinion either way. I just want that we 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 are aware that this has a bit of weight, historical weight. 
full disclosure, um, obviously, as someone or as a company providing services on top of Cortex, blah, 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 there is a strong incentive to, to not be tied to only allowing file-based configuration, while at the same time, I argue strongly that we need to constrain what you can configure in order to create those alerts that we actually at least say what what stances need to be in the configuration and the the consideration here was to was to basically like that's where we came out in the discussion grafana internally um just for full disclosure um an alternative which we considered initially but discarded during the discussion is to just mandate what needs to be configured and then leave it to the implementer of how to configure it. Um, the reason why we discarded this is, um, of course, you could, in theory, have really painful workflows for, um, for anyone wanting to do Prometheus alerting. Uh, yet wanting to have that stamp of approval, like they could, in like similar to how Zoom supported uh, web browsers for years, of course, probably they were forced to by a tender or something, but in practice, it never worked. Um, and that's the kind of uh, user pain which which we wanted to avoid. That's why we came out at at that consideration. Um, of course, we initially, we also thought about just mandate that we can push that configuration towards um, like that complete file. Um, but then basically user access, uh, security, split remote, uh, split different configuration parts, blah, blah, blah. All those nice features are not possible in this model. So this just to, to give you the rundown of of the discussion, which basically Bjorn Ganesh and I had uh, like a week or two ago. Um, another historic context from the Prometheus side, and that is important, um, only have one way to, to do things. I can see how um, a text file is a good default, because you have deployment and like in, in a Google modeled deployment model, it, it makes absolute sense because you just push that configuration to disk and you can just kill the machine and spin up a new one for, for if you make any large changes. Um, all that being said, I think that if we have a command line flag where we say we accept an API, we can call this experimental, um, we can actually have Prometheus write carefully to a file because we would get all those niceties of allowing certain users to, to write stuff. Um, the downside is we would open the floodgates of having authentication or verification that you are allowed to do this bit and not allowed to do that other bit, that kind of thing. Um, the final thing, and then I'm going to shut up, is we considered to give uh, a choice in the test suite to either have a configuration file or an API. Um, but this feels kind of disingenuous because it's kind of a Lex Grafana. Um, like you also have the same stuff for Thanos and maybe uh, we would have, I don't know, uh, stack driver and others simply uh, accept the same API course we establish it and everyone who wants to get that stamp of approval simply starts using that API but still it would not be Prometheus it would be all the long-term storages which are not Prometheus and that feels kind of disingenuous but yeah so this is the complete dump of state internal and historic I mean, there's also the, I mean, it was not that Prometheus just said no. We said that you can just run a sidecar that takes config, whatever, changes or config files for an API endpoint and write it to the file and send Prometheus a sick hop, which is very similar to what we said about TLS. You can just have an Nginx sidecar that is a reverse proxy and gives you TLS. So I think there is also a common motive we could say that this whole sidecar thing is kind of getting out of control. So we, we accept that we want more of those features in in the core Prometheus binary, like we have TLS now everywhere. Um, so I'm, it's there could be a way, but it has to be argued carefully. That's what I'm saying. Um, so 
that's the historical thing. The uh, little tidbit, I just posted the Caddy server uh, config API. So I think that's a fairly new thing in Caddy, which uh, they decided, OK, you can just patch the config via an endpoint. right? And I'm not sure if that's good or not, but I just heard there was a bit, lot of buzz about it. And some vocal people said, this is the coolest thing ever. And perhaps we can learn from how this works, good or bad. Uh, if we ever want something like that. Yeah, uh, personally, I, I would just add a few things that I don't believe that if you post a JSON, we should turn it into a small database. I think we should just dump the JSON on disk and so that you can still review your rules uh, on disk if you actually want to review them, that kind of things. And then, well, we already have the admin API, which is optional, so this would just be an an extra optional argument just like that. And now we actually have authentication and TLS natively, so you can at least protect yourself a bit from um, disabled behavior. So I think it makes sense, and I would love to have a Terraform provider to push my Prometheus alerts. Do we have an idea of like what the API contract will be? Well, uh, it's... So I guess it would be just rest. So you put, uh, you you post or you delete your rule, and then we create or we delete the file and we reload the configuration. I mean, like a rule or a, a, a file. A, you just push or, the file. Or, or file. Yes. That, that's why I'm asking that because I think the Grafana proposal is actually at a different level. It's at the rule level. Sorry, I didn't catch that. There was some noise. I, that. I think the Grafana proposal, the, the API is at the rule level, not at the file. Yes, yeah. or maybe even substances, but there is no, I don't think we have a full proposal yet. Um, if there is consensus that an API is acceptable, either by Prometheus accepting it or by suggesting a, an API which covers use cases for basically beyond what Prometheus would need, um, we would be more than happy to, like we as in Grafana Labs, would be more than happy to, to invest time in that thing and define it. Obviously working in the open and just handing a public design document and everyone can give feedback, blah, 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 blah. I don't think it would be immediate anyway. I think it would be towards the end of year. Yeah, and I, I also don't think you need to be really granular about this. I think it's it's more important to have like consistent rule groups than to be able to update one rule. I mean, honestly, at that point, the question only becomes for writing that thing that you say you must, for example, accept um, on a rule level and you may accept sub rule level if you want to, like those kinds of things um, that you specify an API and you just say which parts of that API are required and which are optional. And I think it would make sense to, to have a really basic API, basically something which we would be happy with Prometheus running. So for example, I don't think Prometheus should have a super granular thing where I have a role-based access control uh, through 20 different mechanisms, blah, 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 blah. That's not something I would want to see in Prometheus, uh, but it's something which makes sense in a cloud host offering. So making those things optional, and having a basic API, which must be supported. And if you want to have more granularity, you must do it this way. But doing it as a may, like that kind of thing. No, I don't think we need to specify stuff that we would not implement ourselves, especially with cloud providers. I don't think you can tell cloud providers how they need to design their APIs. I don't think it's reasonable to, to think they would follow that. I disagree. If Prometheus designs an API in a certain way and says that if you want to offer this functionality, you have to have something which follows this and that uh, design principle or needs to be compatible to this and that thing, um, 
if they want to have Prometheus compatibility as a thing, then they need to support it. So there would be a strong incentive to support it. Um, but I mean, we are we are in the implementation of a detail of the API already. So let's do the step before. Should we allow an API in the test suite? I think that's the first point of consensus. Or should we mandate that you must configure your alerting rules through a file? Or should we just not define it? Out of those three options, my personal preference is that we allow an API. So yeah, this but... is just for the compliance test, right? Yeah. For sending alerts into the thing, we just then test it and generate alerts. I think it's best to have also on Prometheus, like we first have it on Prometheus if we have a consensus on it, and then follow up to com compliance and not the other way around. I, I, I'm trying to build the consensus in layers so we so we arrive at the thing. Okay. But we can also do it directly. Should we have behind an experimental feature flag an API to, to send alerting, alert configuration rules to Prometheus itself? All agreed? Anyone disagree? I, I have to think about this, but I don't want to disagree. <laughs> See, that, that's OK. So let's walk back a step. Abstain. Um, Abstain. No, totally fine. Uh, I, I didn't think we would have this. Um, here so should we allow an api for setting alerting rules in the test suite yeah but that's that's the question right that's and fine then, if we also have an prometheus but if you don't have an prometheus one might argue it's not fine um ish i would argue that if prometheus is, defines an api and in particular cortex and thanos um, start implementing and using this API, um, then there is a strong case to be made that this is the Prometheus way of running that thing. Um, yeah. And also, frankly speaking, um, Prometheus team gets to define what it means to be Prometheus compatible. Like, I mean, obviously within reason, we can't be malicious about this, but beyond this, if we as team agree that we want to see a certain thing or we want to allow or disallow a certain thing, then we can just decide this as long as we have technical arguments. That's what maintainership is. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think Julian said that, right? That if we if we have something in the test suite that Prometheus doesn't understand itself, like pushing rules for an API, which you might not implement Prometheus itself. If that's a problem. Like for me personally, I don't see that as a big problem, but this might be seen as like a Lex Cofana or Lex Cortex or something, right? Um, the, um, the, the other point is that um, we have changed the approach. Like at the beginning, Julius was launching the remote write test. And at that point, it would have made sense to say, hey, we want standard APIs to configure it because it's a pain for Julius to go and find a specificity of a replot rider. Now we are in more like a, a, you test yourself compliance stuff and not like we will test everyone, but it will be like more self compliance from what I understood from the CNCF. So we don't need to do that in the compliance suit because people will test their own tools and provide us with the results. I would not give, I mean, speaking as someone working at a vendor with my Prometheus hat on, I don't want to trust any company, even Grafana Labs, to do everything perfectly and just hand over test results. I want to be able to reproduce. And I want to be the wider community to be able to reproduce and actually keep other vendors honest. I want, if, if Grafana Labs does something wrong in any of those tests, I want it to be really easy for someone to find out, hey, there is a mistake, you need to fix this. Um, and I can tell you that obviously Grafana would fix it very quickly. Um, and if, if Grafana does not, then it should lose the mark and everything. And that's the same rule for everyone else. 
So I think it should be possible to test it super simply. And that means we need to have a customer accessible API to set those things. I don't want a closed source company which has a cloud offering, which I cannot even test myself, tell me, hey, I self-certified that Prometheus alerts are working. That is not good. Yeah. I mean, I fully understand. I just the problem is if we then allow a config push API that happens to be the same as the one Cortex implements, but it's not implemented on Prometheus itself, then we get this smell of, okay, you're you're like doing the Cortex thing here, and you're you're making it harder for everyone else. Of course, of course, but that can be solved to some extent by making this thing public and and having a public. Uh, discussion about this. The third option is to just mandate how that configuration needs to be structured. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that gets us into, into troubled waters already, because then someone can just take this, con uh, this specification, say, yes, yes, I did it. And in truth, they don't have four or five minutes. They have four, four minutes and 39, uh, 59 seconds. Because of their implementation, they don't do the five minutes and they have something subtly different, blah, 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 but they take some liberty. Into, like that kind of thing is what I want to avoid. Yeah. I mean, I, I would personally be fine with having this API push first just for the test suite, but I would be curious, I mean, genuinely curious what, for example, people who work for other vendors that are not Cortex backed what they would think about it. If they have no issue, then great, right? But I, I don't think we would adopt the Cortex uh, way of working because they only push one whole group at a time, and that's not practical at all. So the Cortex one in general is, is, I don't think that, Lent Gotham just wrote this, by the way. Um, I don't think anyone likes the current Cortex implementation mm -hmm. without making a new one. OK, but then even better, then we just create a better API just for the test suite. If that turns out to be very awesome, then we, we would have additional incentive to adjust, adopt it within Prometheus proper. And nobody can blame us that we have preferential treatment for Cortex. Well, I, I am almost sure that we maybe even have a close pull request with this in Prometheus Prometheus. Yeah, probably. I mean, yeah. this is a very frequent request feature. No. I just like what has a smell for me uh, if we decide this now under the pressure of getting a compliance suite done and not with the like primary motivation we want to have a feature that's good for our users. The, the easy way out, if this is a strong concern, um, is to just specify for now what needs to be what needs to be put in. So let's try and find a consensus. Also, uh, please try and write stuff because uh, we lost quite a bit. I mean, we have public recordings now yet. So consensus. We I think that uh, I think that I like the mix tool uh, server which is doing this actually. So mix tool, they have a server that just take post and they just write the file and then they call reload in, in Prometheus. You mean you write a, a an alerting mix and a generic one in? in no, no, no. Mix tool provides post to post your Prometheus rule files to Prometheus. It's mixed tool server. That's that's what it's called. Fair. Just so for now, just a moment. We need to.
Okay, let's try the big one or the relatively big one. Consensus, we will specify what configuration, um, sorry, just a moment, what configuration. Okay, consensus, we will specify, Gotham, you need to click out, I can't read. Um, thank you. Consensus, we will specify what configuration alerts need to follow. We intend to work on an API for creating slash changing rules. This API might be optionally used for testing or added to Prometheus behind an experimental feature flag. Gotham has a question, is it just alerts or rules? Uh, it, it is the same in Prometheus. Yeah, alerting so rules, first. alerts and rules or alerts slash rules should be. Okay, so let's try again. We will specify what configuration alerts slash rules need to follow. We intend to work on an API for creating slash changing them. This API might be optional used for testing or added to Prometheus behind an experimental feature flag. All agreed, anyone disagreeing? Julius looks unhappy. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure about the feature flag bit for like general usage yet, but okay. I don't know. I mean, it's a might on purpose. Okay, might. So it doesn't mean that someone can immediately do it and there's <laughs> no. No, but no. And I mean, anyone is able to, to call a vote for any reason anyway. Yeah. Uh, but okay. the, the point here is we should have an honest expectation of this being of high enough quality that we would be happy with it um, to, to use it in Prometheus. So ideally, even if we don't use it in Prometheus, it should be of a quality that we would in theory be happy to use it in Prometheus. If there's no other architectural reason why we would not want to have. Yes. Like, okay. Basically make it as good as we possibly can and honestly can. Um, so it follows the Prometheus way. Prometheus way. Uh, okay, so should I read it again or are you happy with this? Or should we amend or write something more? Or is the might enough? The mighty might. I guess it's enough. Let's do it. Okay. Good, good. Um, looking at the time, we are 18 past. Um, I don't need a break. Do we want a break? Um, sorry, I wanted to unmute and kick myself out. Uh, just like not part of the consensus, just um, if we ever put this feature into Prometheus behind a feature flag or not, I think we should really communicate that we have thought about this carefully. Not, no, we rejected this as a user request. And now that we have a testing suite, we, we just accept it, right? So. It, uh, uh. I would just communicate that this is this is actually a con conscious change of of um, of the approach essentially, and and not just very opportunistic. And then we will need to explain why we do not accept to post like script, new script jobs. Perhaps we we should then. <laughs> I mean, this is what I think. We should have a we should. I think saying no is fine if you do it with the right explanation. And uh, we we already have this tradition of having said no with not necessarily a good explanation. Perhaps we had good reasons, but we didn't explain them well. And um, I think we, whatever we do, we should explain ourselves carefully. And if the the answer is now we need this test suite, and this is why we now say yes, it, it looks it's almost insulting <laughs> in a way. Mm, ish. I mean, I I would have preferred historically to have a lot more flexibility in how you choose to run Prometheus. Um, there are a few hard problems to solve, which we just avoid by, by not engaging on those topics. But I would still argue relatively strongly that even if just for compatibility reasons or for testing reasons, we create an API which we allow. Um, 
that this is already a good enough argument in, in and as of itself. Of course, the, the benefit to the overall ecosystem in having proper testing and reliable testing and, and having certainty for both implementers and users that this is actually compliant with that uh, interface of Prometheus is already a substantial value across the ecosystem. Uh, I see a big problem in your reasoning is that if you force that for the compliance, it means that Prometheus will not be compliant if it does not have the API. Uh, no. Maybe it would be an option, like, right? Like, um, that, no. I don't see that argument at all. Of course, we can say that if you have an API, it must look like this. We can also say if you have an API, it should look like this. Like we, we have that flexibility. Um, and as long as we have a, a reasonable argument, that's what we define. I personally think we should have a, a much stronger stance on compatibility than we had historically. I mean, we are already getting there with the compatibility test suite, but looking at at how incompatible some some projects or vendors are, which claim that they are compatible, we should have aggressively or more aggressively engaged with this years ago. And but from what I see in the chat for Ganesh, we don't need that because we will not give any recording rules. We just need the get API that Prometheus has now. I don't get that. Well, Prometheus already has an API to get the alerts, right? So you just need to implement what Prometheus has. You don't push recording rules from what I see from Ganesh in the chat. Um, Is that correct, Ganesh, that we don't want to push or to force certain rules? Um, in the chat, we're discussing about the new endpoint that we're currently discussing for pushing alerting rules and recording rules. But I think you're talking about the alerts itself and not the Okay. Rules. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, I just I, I mix recording rule and alerts. Okay. Also, FYI, anything which happens in the chat is by design ephemeral. Uh it's neither in the in the uh, in the written logs nor is it part of the of the public recording. So please avoid this. Um, but Always feel free to speak up, even or in particular, if you're not a Prometheus team member. So if you want to replay this, Levy, feel more than welcome to, to raise your voice. You're free to, to interject at any point in this discussion. The only point in time where we ask people to not engage is during the call for consensus. At any other time, go ahead. Or I can read it out if you don't have a microphone or something. That's also completely fine. So let's see if we need to read anything out. No, yeah, okay. Okay, it, 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 okay. Um, but yeah, everyone in particular, people who are not on Prometheus team, please, please, please feel welcome to uh, speak up at any point. Um, okay, so. Um, Let's move to the next topic, I guess. Date and location for... Should we have a short break after all? Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Um, it's now 24 past, so let's say we take a six minute break or we meet at the half hour. Yeah. Sharp. Uh, okay, cool. Then see you in five. We can sing and dance in the meantime. I can show you this awesome, well-distanced, um, oh, you can't really see it, properly socially distanced um, vacation home. Which country is it? I, the, Germany. I don't leave the jurisdiction and or healthcare system. I mean, I would like to, but... Um, 
Yeah, now, you have all the painful, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, like for now, uh, having the same jurisdiction and healthcare system um, is just prudent. I mean, it's, it's, it's state level, how you have the specific implementation of the rules, but we are in a reasonably sane area of Germany. So. The state chancellor here is not trying to kill the population, as opposed to one other. So maybe to just use the time if neither of us are planning to, to leave uh, here. Um, my main reasoning is by mandating a specific API, we can ascertain or at least some properties of an API. Uh, like I, I wouldn't specify how you do authentication or something, but like what you need to transport, what endpoints need to be available, how they need to be named, even if they are, like even if you don't prescribe the URL or maybe you only prescribe a substring or something, like those are all open topics. And I think that it's very, very malleable, but by specifying how the core functionality of an API is, you can have a lot of an easier time to test stuff. Julius found this in his PromQL testing where even if stuff is fully compatible or compliant, um, it was harder for him to automate stuff or to find certain things, how to run certain things. Of course, implementers were free to put this there ever basically as opposed to having this, I don't know, we can, we can even say you need to publish a list in the, in the testing repository, for example, like, if Grafana Labs or AWS or Azure or who, whoever want to be tested, they need to have a subdirectory or a file in that test suite, which defines those three or five or 10 endpoints and have a three line summary of how authentication works. Like that, that stuff is all completely fine. It's not about telling cloud providers or any other offers how to run their stuff but it is very much about enabling any customer or user of a service to run those tests themselves, like maybe not day one, like promptly I need quite a bit of work, for example, but at some point have the ability that a user, if they so choose, can just run this as part of their, I don't know, monthly infrastructure health checking or what have you. Like that's the intention. And for this, you need to have more than just, okay, do whatever. Like in the extreme, you could even say that that we could allow, um, that we define a configuration and then you need to provide as a cloud provider or project or something need to provide a tool which takes this configuration and turns it into something which works with your offering. Like in that in that range, I think we have quite some some um, leeway, but I feel extremely strongly that we need to nail down that it's easy for people to automate this and for end users to just run it without a lot of effort. Is that the case for Kubernetes? I don't know. I, don't I, I just know that with Kubernetes, all you need to do is to send the XML and the logs with your test run? I know that in particular, the PromQL ones are not fully automated at the moment anyway, which uh, medium term is a little bit of a concern. Uh, also, we have aspects which might not ever be fully automatable. Um, but we are not bound by what Kubernetes does or does not do. Um, we need to have a technical reason for what we do. 
or not even a technical, like even if it's a, a procedural reason, that's completely fine. Oh yeah, by the way, ding, 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 everyone back on board. Ideally switch on your camera if you are here. Um, as long as we as long as we mandate it and, and it's defensible, we can just do it. <clears throat> Good Ben. I'm proud of you. Also, your flossing or your salvia is not very hard, or you went to teeth cleaning recently. Speaking as someone who has tons of minerals in their salvia and could not do this without everyone being afraid. So next topic, date and location for Prometheus and A and EU. That would be me. It's a me, Riccio. So um, just to give you a quick update, um, Reminder, I think it was last time, or maybe it was second to last, but I think it was last time where we said that we are fine with alternating with KubeCon locations to basically uh, when KubeCon is in uh, EU, have it in North America and vice versa. Um, it still needs some coordination between KubeCon and PromCon and probably or some Prometheus content during KubeCon as well. Of course, I mean, that might mean that we actually have four things per year or five if you consider China, but talking just about PromCon as a distinct event, alternating with, um, with KubeCon, which would bring us to having, um, having North America in spring-ish and Europe in basically October, November, fall-ish. I know Julius would prefer to have high summer for every single event. Um, but beyond this, are there any concerns, considerations, anything? In particular, non-team members as well? Okay, so in this case, the careful planning would be early next year uh, in Vancouver. Of course, uh, CNCF still has a reservation with the venue which was planned for last year in Vancouver. Um, I think it would probably be March or April just to be on the safe side with COVID for at least a substantial part of the world. Um, and it would mean October, November for Europe, most likely November, at least if we want to have that one venue in Munich. But as long as I'm the main organizer, I would prefer to keep it there. I can travel quickly and not, not have huge travel. Either everyone agrees or I'm muted. The only thing is that I think you should make sure to sync with uh, our team member who lives in Vancouver. Yes, of course. Um, the you... last time we talked about this with CNCF, Callum was in that sync. Um, yeah. I, I don't think Callum really cares, or I know he doesn't really care when things happen. Um, it's driven by externalities anyway. Like if we have a, I don't know, variant early next year, we will move it again. But is it still the case that the Vancouver one will be more organized by CNCF and the November one more by like you? Depends. Um, I mean, to some, like, ish. So for, uh, for Vancouver, we have a hotel, which is professional for the venue, blah, blah, blah. As far as I know, it's also uh, more expensive um, than than what I historically had for um, for Munich, um, also for Berlin. What Julia said, um, like those aspects, yes. Um, so more of the of the on-site coordination would be through CNCF. Um, the rest, no. Um, like 
In particular, things like registration and such, um, I want to run ourselves to have um, the family wipe, like having, like we had in, I think, 2018, um, CNCF staff on site to support during registration and such, completely fine, don't mind. Um, but well, what I would like to avoid is one PromCon which costs like 250 euro and the other one which costs 50 euro. The North American one will be more expensive. Of course, the venue is markedly more expensive. And unless we find someone who is able and willing to carry as much weight on the North American side as I am on the European side, this is unlikely to change. Of course, it is significant overhead on my end to, to have something as cheap and um, efficient as we have in Munich. Like I'm, I'm probably switching venue. The new venue would, will support, I think it's 800 people um, in Munich, um, as opposed to the 220 we have at Google. But it's, I forgot, but it's low five figures what it costs. It's not medium six figures what what a, a medium hotel is costing you. Like there are offers in Munich where people wanted to have several hundred K just for the venue, basically. Um, and I just don't take them. But obviously, this saves immense amounts of time. So if someone, if we find someone in the US who's willing to do the same kind of thing, um, absolutely. But I. Honestly, I think that uh, the European PromCon for the foreseeable future will remain cheaper than a North American uh, PromCon, simply due to the whole logistics and such. Okay. I mean, maybe we have, yeah. I, I can't see into the future. I, I would love to build out more people who, who can carry this themselves. On the other hand, I know what immense amount of work this is. Um, but I would love to build out people who, who can carry this to the extent which I'm carrying it locally in, in, uh, in Europe. Anyone who's seen this recording and wants to really go all in and can commit and make a hard commitment, poke me. I would be thrilled to share all my secrets and pain. And I mean, maybe, maybe um, Callum is the one um, that we see in a year or two or even next year that he can carry everything or most of the things alone. And then we just have Vancouver as a recurring venue um, in, uh, in North America. Like all of those things are fine. I think having recurring venues or recurring cities at least, um, if you have an established person who, who carries this stuff is completely fine. And also, like if everyone of Prometheus team starts moving to Munich anyway, because it's just an objectively better city than Berlin. That's. Are we asking the CNCF for an hybrid uh, online venue for March? To have an online pendant? I would prefer not. I mean, I would prefer to have an online component. But I don't think that online component will be extremely strong. Um, the inherent problem is if you, like looking at how CCC does it and stuff, um, even there where you have digital natives, uh, as it were, and like you have uh, distinct people who ask questions from the internet and such. 
it's still objectively a second class or third class experience um, to be online. At which point you need to decide, is it worth the extra effort and coordination and everything versus the actual benefit? I mean, speaking personally, I, I, I prefer the hallway track anyway. I don't really care about, I mean, I care about the, the talks, but I mainly care about, about the hallway track and meeting people in person. And I dare say that this is at least a substantial aspect for, for most attendees who actually go in person, because else you could just like watch the video and write email to follow up if you want to just have the, the raw um, talk without anything else. As to coordination, um, you have so many things which are just changing and which you can easily cushion over if you're live or in person versus which you cannot when you're uh, online. Like, I mean, things like the toilets breaking at Google last year or two years ago, um, that, that's the kind of thing which you don't have in, in an online thing but you cannot start a minute earlier if you have an online component or five minutes. I mean, you can start in theory five minutes later for a thing, but you cannot say, okay, that one thing is skipped. I'm just completely changing the schedule and everyone should be here three minutes early and then we have this other talk. Like that's the kind of thing which you cannot really do if you have even a partial online component. So there is opportunity cost if you have an online event. All that being said, I have no idea what happens with COVID. Um, and okay. the last question is, do you plan to, do we plan to host a developer summit physically or do we keep the online stuff? I, I don't think there is a, a realistic way to, to make any call for North America. I would like to have an in-person dev summit for Europe. Um, if we have, I know, half a dozen people in, in North America, we can also have the others call in. But again, this is a second or third class experience. I think we should retain the online dev summits for as long as we have content. Um, looking at the, at the size of the backlog and also of the, at the weight and importance of the decisions, uh, we used to be very selective in what we can even talk about. And even then we overran in the in-person one versus here, we are actually going through backlog at an impressive pace. Like this call, we had a total of four topics up to now, and that's actually low by our standards. If you look at the others, sometimes we have five, six, seven topics, which we go through. So, um, as long as we have backlog, but I don't think we can plan any of this. Okay, so I think uh, but that's all for this topic. Okay. Thank you for taking care of all of the PromCon stuff, Richie, by the way. No worries. I, I'm insane that way, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Next topic. Just a moment, I need to check. Also, I think it is Jan who's still writing all the things, but I saw some th someone write stuff. So thank you yet again. Um, okay, we have neither Bartek or Frederick here. Um, but just to bounce it without intention to actually talk about this right now, renaming of alert manager and better names. That's somewhat relevant when it comes to alert generator and such as well. Well, so just to, to put it back into the head of people so they can think about it. Um, so the two things which we can talk about are either migrating away from GoGo Protobuf or PromQL changes for histograms and beyond. Histograms and beyond. <laughs> uh, no, but um, any preferences between those two? OK, 
can any topic be done in 15 minutes? You can try. We can also just start and we can we can just stop. We can also open the floor. Like Jan, you said you had something which you wanted to get onto the agenda. So maybe we just flip the complete script of how we do things and you get the last 15 minutes. I'm not sure what you're talking about and I'm unprepared. D didn't you say you wanted to get something onto the agenda? No. no? But you asked how to get something onto the agenda. Oh, last time. No, at the beginning of this call, or am I completely misremembering? I've asked that before, but not on this call. Then I'm, maybe it was true. OK, anyway. Um, so if, if someone has something burning where they want to speak up, do it now, else as we I mean, it's probably Bjorn talking in either of those topics. So Bjorn, you choose which topic you prefer and just start. Um, my my first in first out queue lost the first topic. Uh, migrate away from GoGo Protobuf. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, no, that's actually not really. I thought I brought it up mostly because I saw that this person was doing kind of half of the work and then said, I cannot do more. You have to take it from here. And I felt a bit sad that nobody took it. Um, but I think Frederick or Julian or someone responded there saying this is actually quite good so far and we should we should pick it up. Um, so um, I mean, I think this is a good thing to discuss perhaps in those 50 minutes to Proto of. Uh, although I'm not the expert, I think the remote write people and remote read people have a way better idea about this. But I stumbled on this when I experimentally brought back Protobuf ingestion to Prometheus that I used the same Protobuf like as the remote write remote read code. Of course, that's already in Prometheus. And then I realized, sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, sorry for interrupting. Just to close it mentally, consensus for the point before, uh, we do it as such. So we, if possible and if COVID allows, we plan to have a PromCon North America early next year and EU late next year. All agreed? Anyone disagreeing? OK, cool. Sorry, I, I write it down in market green because it's not super important. Uh, Bjorn, continue. Um, so, So yeah, so we use this GoGo Protobuf thing, which is pretty good. It was much better than the original implementation from like a performance perspective and a Go idio, idio, idiomatics perspective, if that's a word. Um, the but it's unmaintained, right? And there was fundamental changes in the official implementation, and I think there's the context is that the GoGo Protobuf developers say that they would love to like update to that or something, but it needed a lot of work and no one is there in the project. And they asked for volunteers to step up and nobody volunteered. So it's kind of in maintenance or it's not even maintenance mode, right? It's an unmaintained mode. <laughs> um, uh, but there is um, hope. <laughs> there is this uh, Protobuf uh, initiative by uh, the YouTube MySQL something, what's the word? Yes. Sorry? Yes. I just heard S. Vitesse. Vitesse. Yeah, exactly. Vitesse. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so they did something. It's not as far reaching as GoGo Protobuf, but it might be the parts that we need. And I think this is where this suggestion is, um, is about. And uh, I think someone who has a bit of context. Uh, with Protobuf, hopefully better than me, could uh, pick this up and do it. Um, I think was Bartek also there in the discussion, but he's not, not here anymore. So ideally, someone in the room has context and would like to pick it up or know someone who can pick it up. I know Bartek and Frederick wanted to discuss this, and neither of them is here. Yeah. So we just have consensus that Bartek and Frederick will do it. Done. <laughs> we, we should also impose a time limit in the consensus. Let's say <laughs> end of tomorrow, end of business.
tomorrow. It's so easy. And quick question to the um, GitHub link. The, is that the link uh, we're talking about? Because that looks like it's related to histograms. Yeah, that's not that's not the right one. Um, that that must have been. No, that's a that's completely different. Yeah, okay, that was probably my copy and paste problem in the preparation doc. Let me find the right link. You, you can you can discuss the rest. I will extract the right link. Damn it. I mean, if nobody has anything to say about it, then we really have to wait for. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the IP is not with the buff tool. That's what. I heard, but like the branch is still there. That the, the problem, and I think we should do that, but also look like how it will interact with the gRPC and that kind of thing that we might see in the code or that we might want to introduce for some service coverage in the future. But I don't have strong opinions there. Mm. Yeah, Neither. I think it's just the just the branch, right? Because that's what Frederick wrote in the email discussion. I think it'd be most useful to rebase and create APR from this. Then we can see where the test pass and we can run prom bench. Although I don't think there are any proof tests and what protobots. Then we can discuss on there and figure out where to take this. Thanks you so much for the work. Blah blah blah. Okay, so I think we only have this branch by Austin is his name. Uh, so let's put the branch as created. The cruiser. Okay. So that's the branch. Now it's in the, in the document. Uh, is that the buff tool? I think so. And I, then I think. I remember vaguely that Barty chimed in and talked about the buff tool and stuff like that. I mean, if we don't have strong opinions here, should we just have a consensus that we don't have strong opinions? And basically, Bartek and Frederick should go figure it out with, I forgot their name, and do whatever. I mean, we could have the consensus that we don't want to keep relying on an unmaintained protobuf implementation, and that something has to be done, and that this yeah. one could very well be it. Then we should um, uh, we should um, follow up on it and and do it. Whoever finds time and is qualified. That's even better. So okay, let's try this. I need, sorry, Jan, there's no way around this. Um, now I'm not breaking your thing anymore. That's one of the unfeatures of, of. Yeah. Consensus, we intend to deprecate Gogo Protopuff and Austin's branch is a decent candidate. All agreed, anyone disagree? Right. 
which is also hopefully getting Bartek, Fredek, and Austin's the, the go ahead, basically. Five minutes left. Any other pressing topics, or I can farm the thing for anything which is short? Well, if I have Bjorn and Julius in this call, I can take profit of that. So we are introducing trigonometry functions. And in the documentation, I did ask to have them just in a simple list, because like there is not much to document. It is in a course in a, that kind of things. But it means that this is a change with regard to all the other functions, which are in alphabetical order. And they, do, they will not show directly in the table of contents. So the question is that, is that acceptable to you, Bjorn, that we just like simplify the documentation for those functions as one? And maybe even later, we group all the calendaring function into one uh, one other uh, section, that kind of things. I would even go further and eventually do them all in groups. Because, I mean, alphabetic looks nice, um, but nobody nowadays looks them up alphabetically, right? You just hit Control F and search for the function if you know the name. And if you don't know the name, you want grouping because you think, oh, I would like if there's a trigonometric function, and then you go to that section um, if you don't know what they're called, for example, right? So I would even say, even now, it would make more sense to group them. But it becomes pressing if we have like this explosion of function uh, that, that I mean, it would be a very, very long list and, and grouping them, calendar function, trigonometric functions, whatever we have. Yeah, I was just thinking when I read your comment, Julian, like, how can we make it machine readable somehow that because like, for from lens, for example, to generate to put the docs into the application, and I think others might have that problem as well, you want to surface the documentation for a function in a UI. Um, I generate that from the current doc and I have some exceptions for the overtime and function uh, overtime functions in there. Um, but it would be in general nice to have kind of also a machine readable version of function documentations, which then led me to the thought, like, should we even, you know, just write them into a markdown? Or should they be like living with the function somewhere and then compiled from that or something? But I haven't really thought further mm -hmm. about that yet. But that that's maybe one thing to keep in mind that you know there will be use cases not just you know from lens but I, I can see others where you want to actually show the function documentation automatically somewhere and that, that yeah yeah definitely right the one consideration for putting it with the code is version documentation and such needs to be a little bit more complicated then. Um, of course, you need to look into version branches in other repositories, blah, 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 instead of having this in a flat structure. But we can also just have a generator which is pointed at the right direction and treat the, the bits and pieces in docs as basically the output of a machine readable thing somewhere else. Long story short, I think having more of this auto-generated and machine readable makes sense because it allows reusing. Yeah, the question is if we put it in the code, what format is it? Because we still want to have markdown in the end and probably you still want to write markdown because you want to be able to link to stuff from the docs. So, but then when you're writing markdown somewhere in the Go code, then it will not be syntax highlighted for you and all that. So that will be annoying. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a good answer to this yet, but it would be nice to be able to auto-generate it somehow. Or to at least make the result machine readable. That that would be cool. The best answer is probably XML and having excellent XML. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, um, we can have a SOAP API to fetch it. Um, no, I mean, um, you could have you could just have a file living with the thing. But I mean, taking a step back before we overcomplicate, if we break this down into individual markdown files, which are then combined at compile time, and we just give them a flag, and that 
that <laughs> compiles them into the right categories, that kind but, of thing. Julius, do you think we could do the opposite and take the, de the definition and documentation from the laser stuff and generate markdown? So the laser stuff only has abridged docs in there. That's just the textual input support. Okay. And it only has like a one line snippet. Um, yeah. We can change this if we so choose. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, eventually, it could be cool to even show the I mean, more documentation in Laser itself, yeah. uh, like in in the actual text input box. Um, but uh, I, I can see we could just use uh, maybe Godoc to generate uh, as the official documentation for this, maybe for the function, and then generate the Laser out of that and the Markdown out of that. As we are at time, um, I mean, I, I don't have any problem uh, tacking on a little bit of more time, but just to to respect everyone else's time. Um, as to subcategories, it's probably a case of JFDI. I think we have consensus that it's fine. It will just be harder to parse afterwards, but that's fine, I guess. I have to Yeah, start. but <laughs> we, we can just have a good generate stuff that would just generate any format you would want. I mean, if we if we want this really cleanly with the machine readable thing, we need it to reform it anyway because of the overtime functions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah but, but if you're just going to make it more human readable now, uh, that's going to be less machine readable. If you just like change that one markdown file to just have no, 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 you, you understand. Together. My, my point is that we have the consensus on that the outcome on the website is that we allow oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. without defining how the implementation should be done. Because this should ideally be done within the uh, docs working group anyway. My gut is we would just have one file per thing, and then you you have it easier to 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 get to the right thing. And also, we can just build the structure from this. Mm. Uh, but this okay. is something which should probably be done in the docs WG because um, we need to do stuff in that WG anyway. The thing is just we want Levy's PR to get in very soon, right? And this needs the documentation. So for for this PR, we could just write a paragraph in the doc that contains all the trigonometric functions. More or less. <laughs> it makes it less machine readable. But if we now sprinkle this all over the list, I think it's worse for now. Yeah, let's, let's just make a block. Well, the, the, the other possibility is that we just move all the functions by one title level, uh, so they all appear in top, but they still uh, are in their categories. And then Julius can still parse them, but they will just take more space in the documentation. Just instead of parsing H2, we will need to parse H3. Julius, do you actually need stuff to be in alphabetical order to parse it? No, I don't care about the alphabetic order. Just like uh, currently, each function has its own markdown. Uh, I actually pass the markdown currently, so I just look at what's what, you know, whatever works. Yeah, let's let's don't, do. You, you shouldn't think too much of of me. Just like in general, the use case in the future will be interesting for others, maybe also. I so think I don't think we have to find a solution to it now. If you just want to restructure the readme, uh, the, the functions MD any way you want now, that should be fine. And then later on, maybe I can find a solution or not. <laughs> so. so let's write this as a consensus. So we have it. And I think this is a case of enemy uh, perfect being the enemy of good and such. Yeah, functions introducing subgroups.
Consensus, we are okay with introducing subgroups. We want to maintain or improve machine readability. We are okay with things not being perfect while we figure a new scheme out. All agreed, anyone disagreeing? <laughs> okay. Very good. So we are at six past. See you in a month at the latest. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Greg, and your PTO. It helps. Stop now.